Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our sermon title today is This We Proclaim. And I tell you what, I can proclaim that all my life he's been faithful. All my life he's been good. So good. Yeah, we have hard times. We have things we don't like. But guess what? It's all good. And if everything goes wrong your whole life, and you die and stand before him in heaven, and you made it to heaven, it won't even matter. <laughs> because from then on, it would really be good forever. Yeah. Amen? Yes, yeah, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're going to have a, a quick, well, I'm not going to rush to it, but it's not going to be long. It has nothing to do with the heat. <laughs> yeah. uh, this we proclaim. This we proclaim. Titus 3, 3 through 7, as was read earlier in our scripture reading, and I'm going to read it now from the, the uh, Amplified Version. So all of my scriptures today will be read from the Amplified Version. This we proclaim. First of all, first point that we proclaim is that God is kind. God is kind. You know that? So many times he's, he's, he's portrayed as angry God. He hates sin and he does hate sin. And they focus on all the things that make you think God is mad at you. Something's wrong. But God is kind. And reading that, we're going to have this thought. The road to success is always under construction. The road to success is always under construction. Titus 3, 3 says, For we also were once thoughtless and senseless, obstinate and disobedient, deluded and misled. We too were once slaves to all sorts of cravings and pleasures, Wasting our days in malice and jealousy and envy, hateful, hated, detestable, and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior to man, as man appeared, he saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but because of his own pity and mercy, by the cleansing bath of the new birth, regeneration, and renewing of the Holy Spirit which he poured out so richly upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And he did it in order that we might be justified by his grace, by his favor, wholly undeserved, that we might be acknowledged and counted as conformed to the divine will and purpose, thought and action, and that we might become heirs of eternal life according to our hope. We have been justified by grace. And this is the best way to remember how your status is with God. When you hear the word justify, break it down like this. Just if I'd never sinned. When God looks at you now, it's just if you've never sinned. If you've given him your heart and you look to him as your savior, you are justified. And he looks at you as just if you never committed a sin in your life. You know, we used to pass out these tracts. Talk about, you know, when you get to heaven and you get there and they have this big screen and all your sins going to come across and God's going to judge you. And, oh, my Lord. Can you imagine going through that with millions and millions and millions? It'd it take the rest of eternity just to walk out. Who, who sin did one? Some of them. Some of our sin by ourselves take up the whole, anyway. But anyway. <laughs> but God watched that thing clean. The ones that, the ones that got to sin, they ain't going to be there. They're going to be in hell. Not by, not by God's choice, but by their own choice, because he is freely offering this to all who would receive it. Amen? Amen. It's a free gift. Free. And that free gift catapults us into representing him and living for him in a way that other people would want to say, hey, what's that you got? I know you've been going over there that Wesley Chapel tree. What y'all doing over there? I, I want to know something about that. Yeah. That's what it should do. It's your say, oh, man, you don't know West Chapel, man. They believe you can do whatever you want to do. Just keep on sinning and go to hell. Heaven, excuse me, go to hell. <laughs> we don't believe that. Because if you've been changed, if you look to him, he changes you. Yeah. Now, he don't change everybody as quickly as we all like. Some people might deal with the same thing for 20 years. Some people might give it up the same day. But don't change anything. God's patient with you until you give it up. Right. Amen? Amen? And then in Romans 2, 4, it says this. It says, 
And are you so blind as to trifle with and presume upon and despise and underestimate the wealth of his kindness and forbearance and long-suffering patience? Are you unmindful or actually ignorant of the fact that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repent, to change your mind and inner man to accept God's will? So when you hear the word repent, don't think about me confessing all my sins and, I, and crying at the altar. Now that might be a part of you repenting, but the word repent it has two meanings. First of all, this. Repent means to change the way you think. If you think it's all right to commit adultery, then you got to change the way you think. It ain't all right to commit adultery, right? If you think it's all right to murder somebody, you got to change your mind. It's not all right to murder somebody. Now, repent means this. If you're going in this direction, that's the wrong way. You got to turn and go the other direction. So if I'm going this direction toward adultery, I got to change and go this way away from it. If I'm going this way toward murdering somebody, I need to go this way away from it. Don't worry, and if you cry and weep after that, that's fine. I ain't saying you can't cry and weep. But to cry and weep, people cry and weep, and all they did was went down and cried and weeping sin and got up, and they ain't never repented. Right. Have no intention of changing. But God is good, and his, he's kind. So his kindness leads us to repentance. Second thing is, God is merciful. I love that. Anyone who has never made a mistake, has never tried anything new. If you miss somebody, they ain't never made a mistake. They ain't never tried that. If you got one thing down, that's all you're doing. Okay. But anybody that tries anything new or tries something, go make mistakes, right? Right, right. This is what God told Daniel. Daniel 9, 18 and 19. Daniel said this, Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and look at our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you for our own righteousness and justice, but for your great mercy and loving kindness. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, give heed and act. Do not delay for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. The mercy of God. Mercy means simply this, you don't get what you deserve. See, when we come to the throne of grace, when God wants to give us his grace, we can't even come to the throne of grace until he gives us mercy first, Hebrews tells us. He says, he gives you your mercy first. You don't get what you deserve to be cast away. He gives you mercy, and he says, come on to the throne. Then he gives you his grace, his unmerited favor. Listen to this. This is about mercy. Believe with every fiber of your heart and mind in the mercy of God. A woman asked Napoleon to have mercy on her son who was about to be hanged. Do you realize the crimes he's committed against France, madam? He doesn't deserve mercy, Napoleon answered. She responded, if he deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy, emperor. At that moment, her son was set free. You see, mercy is <laughs> not what we deserve. He gives us his goodness, his kindness, his graciousness, and his mercifulness. So God is merciful, and then he's kind, he's merciful, and anybody that don't understand the mercy of God ain't never really messed up. Because see, a lot of times we mess up, we think we, you know, everybody's doing what I'm doing, whatever everybody was doing, that's what I was doing. It was wrong. See, sometimes we do what everybody else is doing, but it's wrong. So somebody had to stand up there and I said, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Something wrong with this. This ain't right. Yeah. And so that's what God does when he extends his mercy to us, his kindness to us. Because some, cause sometimes you've been doing something all your life. And that's all you've ever known. Yeah. And then one day, God tapped you on the shoulder. Don't do that no more. Yeah, but this is why I'm, all my friends do this. And, you know, they do it. Everybody else doing this. But that don't make it right. The only thing that makes it right is what God says is right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So God is kind. God is merciful. And God is the one we like here. God is gracious. The only knowledge that can hurt you is the knowledge you don't have. Yeah. If you don't know better, well, can't do better, can you? <laughs> can't do better if you don't know it better. Right. But God is gracious for us. And this is our favorite scripture, minds anyway. Y'all heard me say that, no, sir. 
It's going to be y'all favorite one day. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. It says, for it's by free grace, God's unmerited favor that you are saved, delivered from judgment, and made partakers of Christ's salvation through your faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, of your own doing. It's not through your own striving, but it is the gift of God. Not because of works, lest any man should boast. It is not the result of what anyone can possibly do, so no one can pride himself in it or take glory to himself. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good work, works which God predestined, planned beforehand, that we should walk in them. So even with his free grace, and the fact it's not because of works, when we receive that, we become his handiwork, his workmanship. He recreates us in Christ Jesus, born anew, absolutely new person, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us. Things that we are experiencing now, God predestined, planned it 20, 30 years ago. Stuff happened to me this year. I've been praying for since I was 18. So when did God send the answer? When I was 18? <laughs> I'm just not seeing it now. Because he said yes when I was 18. So if we hang on, we hang on, we just hang on a little while longer. If we hang on, be patient. We will receive what was promised. We will. Not might. We will. And then you know what? Some things you know you see people pray for, they didn't get it. That's right. It's good. It's good. Did their children get it? Yeah. Or their grandchildren get it? Yeah. So the promise is for you and your family and your children and your children. Right. It's just, you know, you, you, sometimes you pray stuff you think it's for you and it's for you to leave yeah. to somebody else. But God is so gracious, he just keeps pouring and giving to us. And he does. So God is kind. God is merciful. God is gracious. And this is my favorite one here. God is love. An optimist believes that we live in the best world. A pessimist is afraid that it might be true. Y'all, let me do that again. An optimist <laughs> believes that we live in the best world. A pessimist is afraid that it might be true. You know, pastors say, well, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know about that. I'll see. Well, no, you won't. <laughs> Probably. Unless God's just gracious and merciful, let you see it anyway. But this is what God does. He gives us his best. He always gives us his best. Scripture, y'all, I know, I know you know these. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten, unique son, so that whoever believes him, trusts in, clings to, relies on him, shall not perish, come to destruction or be lost, but have eternal, everlasting life. Listen at this. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, to reject it, to condemn it, to pass sins on the world. That ain't why he sent his Son. But that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through him. You know, it's amazing how we, we finally realize we're saved by grace. And then we get in the grace of things, we still try to keep working it out again. Why do we do that? Because that's what we're trying. Like I said, you may have heard this all your whole life, but that don't make it right. After you receive him by grace, you still need to walk in grace. I think somebody preached a little sermon a few weeks ago on growing in grace here. We need to grow in that grace, don't we? Yes. And we still stay in grace. So whatever we try to receive from him then, after he has given us his son and given us salvation, then we walk in the grace that he's given us. We don't come to the point after that that we still try to earn it. Or we shouldn't. You know, it don't need to be this quiet in here. I'm sorry. Amen. I thought that was pretty good news. Yeah, myself. Amen. We don't have to walk, we don't have to walk in condemnation. There's therefore now what? Romans 8 once it says, therefore not no condemnation yeah. for those who are in Christ Jesus, period. Some translations say after that, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. But that ain't in the original Romans. 
There's no condemnation to those who walk in Christ Jesus, period. No condemnation, ever. So you ain't got to worry about you getting to heaven the big screen coming up and going. Here's Daryl Pendleton in high school, class of seven. Oh, look what he did at the prom. Look what he did when they went to New Orleans. Don't worry, I didn't do that. I'm just saying, that's just an example. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know about that. What you, what you did at prom? What do you did when they went to New Orleans? Yeah. I ain't did that. Well, I will tell you what I did on the way to New Orleans. Just to show you how, how bad I was. You know, I didn't really do much drinking and cussing and stuff like that. So on the way on the bus to New Orleans, they just passed the bottle of wine around. So I grabbed it. And that was the last sw swallow I ever had wine in my life. I was like, oh, what is this about? Here, take this. It was terrible. So I had my one moment of sin. The pastor had one drink of alcohol. Other than that, I had it at the communion church that they used real wine. <laughs> It ain't the wine. It's not the wine. You know that, right? You know it ain't the wine. It's to get drunk. Yeah. Wine ain't bad in itself. It's just to get drunk hard. Right. Now, don't tell me to start drinking wine. I ain't saying go get drunk this afternoon. <laughs> but I'm just saying. So then we go on past. Okay, then. So, in 1 John 3, 1, look at this, what he says. He says, see what an incredible quality of love the Father has given, bestowed on us that we should be named and called and counted the children of God. And so we are, not going to be, we are. The reason that the world does not know, recognize, and acknowledge us is because it did not know and recognize and acknowledge him. He says we are called the children of God, the sons of God. And the reason people don't recognize it is because when Jesus here, they didn't recognize him. Yes. They kept saying, oh, no, who are you? Who are you? Are you Joseph and Mary's son? Who are you? No savior? You claim me the savior? That's what they said to him. Yeah. After he done miracles, they didn't recognize him. And you can do things that people thought, man, how in the world? People right now looking at me going, how in the world? Daryl Pendleton started a black chamber of commerce. And I'm looking in the mirror and I said, how in the world did Daryl Pendleton start? I don't know how I started. I just did what God told me to do. It just took off. See, all we got to do is obey. Yeah, that's right. And remember who did it. Yeah. So I ain't walk around my head stuck in there. Oh, yeah. Y'all want to hang out with me? Yeah. You know who I am, right? I'm the guy that started Black Chain. Me, that's right. Wouldn't be no Black Chain one for me. You know what God just said, move there. He put somebody in there. Let them start. God didn't need me. He let me do it. It was an honor for him to let me do that. Yeah. Yeah. So how am I going to brag about that? I didn't do nothing. But what he told me to do. Amen. God is good to us. He is love. And look what Solomon said about the love of God. In 1 Kings 8, 23, we'll close with this. And he said, O oh Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven, above and on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing mercy and loving kindness to your servant who walk before you with all their heart. Even before the covenant of Jesus, Solomon recognized that the God of Israel was a good God that he kept covered. He showed us mercy. He showed us his loving kindness to his servants who walk with us. And even when you run away and leave him and say, I'm going to go try something else for a little while. Oh, oh, this ain't working out for me. Guess what he'll do? Some people say, well, see that? You lost your salvation. Well, I, I don't know. See, Jesus used this illustration about this man that had two sons. I said I was going to close. I'm going to close. Uh, Jesus said this man had two sons and one of the sons said Father, give me my inheritance I don't want to do that I want my inheritance now I want it now so he gave his inheritance, he took off ran out, had boy did he have some friends he had all that money he had friends, boy the money started dwindling the friends started disappearing next thing you know he was working slopping hogs and peas and ain't got no money and the Bible said he came to himself uh, in other words, he came to his sense and said, you know what, this is crazy. I can go back home to my father and work for him. My, sir, my father's certainly do better than this. I can at least go back and get a job with my dad. So he starts going back home to his dad. And the Bible says that his dad is coming out on the porch every day looking for his son. And he looked up and he said he saw him at a far distance. And he said, That's sorry, for nothing. I bet you want some money to make him come back home. That ain't what he said. He said, the boy, he ripped his clothes off and ran toward him. And the boy had already had his spirit.
speak to the head. He was like, now I see my father. He said, okay, father, I know I sinned. I forgive you. And before he could get a word out of his mouth, the father scooped him up and hugged him and said, my son, my son. He's what? He's still a son? Yes. My son has come home. Yes. He said, did the bad cow? We're going to have a party. Yes. My son has returned. You see, he ain't lost nothing. He was restored. He didn't have to come back and work with his dad. He was still a son. Yes. And no matter what we do, and it ain't all right to do stuff. Y'all know, I mean, know what I'm saying, but it doesn't matter because his grace is sufficient. But we need to grow in that grace so that we can be better. Why? So we can be what? Holy. Why do we need to be holy? Because people looking at us, they say, oh, you over there at Western Chapel? Oh, you are acting kind of different. Maybe I should come over there and check it out. But they don't see no different in it. <laughs> I can sleep on Sunday morning. Y'all, you ain't no different. Why should I get up? I can just sleep. Or watch TV. Or watch reruns. I have a favorite rerun I watch. But anyway. That's, what we, that's, why, that's why we need to be holy more than anything because we represent him. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. He shines through us. So these things we know, that God is kind, that he is gracious, that he's merciful, and that he is love. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen.